True Peace Ken's Balio and Corba partner for integration of autonomous materials handling trucks and peep the slang. Balio SA this week announced a strategic partnership with Corba AG in which Corba will help integrate Balio's robotic materials handling trucks with supply chains. We are very pleased to pursue this collaboration with Corba as we continue to develop a partner network that meets local and global needs for industry verticals and logistics customers, stated Pasco Rowling, CEO of Balio. Cobra's expertise in warehouse and logistics and their global presence reinforce the complementary nature of our two companies. Man, Peter Slane, our research Saeem, France-based Balio, said it's driven by Balio's technology can transform standard forklifts into autonomous robots for moving pallets, excuse me, in distribution centers and factories. The company, which has subsidiaries in Boston and Singapore, recently also entered into partnerships with Kion, Kai, K-I-O-N, the parent company of Lendi Material Handling, as well as Heister Yale Group INC. It reported 21.7 million, 26 Point forty six million US in sales revenue in twenty twenty. Monopolis based Corbett supply chain said it provides a range of supply chain systems for any business size, strategy, or appetite for growth. Corbett supply chain business unit not only delivers software but also robots, voice technology and materials handling expertise, man, peep the slang, value bridges gap between MHE AMRs. Humans around the world deserve enriching, creative jobs, said Balio. We believe that the pallet movements in D.C. distribution centers and manufacturing sites should be left to fully autonomous robots. The company said it can bridge the gap between traditional material handling equipment, MHE, and autonomous mobile robots, AMRs. This includes forklift, trucks, stackers for floors and low-level pallet movements and reach robots for high racks. Balio added that has developed robots for warehouse applications including tugging, palletization, stacking, and very narrow aisles, VNA tasks. Balio claimed that its geo guidance navigation system, which includes point level detection PLD safety sensors, enables robots to locate their position and navigate autonomously inside buildings without needing additional infrastructure. Man, Video about your pilot is lady robotic trucks at Expo Distribution Center. Expo is the first logistic company to test Bio's latest intelligent robot under real life conditions. Mm -hmm. Pig drop, okay. Ability to maneuver in 2.9 M of our space. Driven by Bio robots, offer great value to APL and distribution centers. Bio, okay, keep the slang. Warehouses and, okay, partnership to open opportunities. Warehouses and distribution centers worldwide are increasingly turning to robots to improve efficiency and competitiveness, said Corba and Bio. The company said they plan to collaborate to integrate Balio's technology and overcome challenges associated with full pallets, bulk movements, and heavy goods. This will result in flexibility, agility, and scalability, smoothly increasing throughput and productivity and company growth, they said. In addition, Corpus integration of Driven by Balio will enhance employee safety, according to the partners. Smart safety and stop and go features will scan the environment in real time for obstruction and instruct the robotic truck or tow tracker to move or stop accordingly. Expanding use of robotic lift trucks can also help operators overcome labor shortages, said Corbett and Balio. Rather than replacing employees, the technology enables people to carry out more valuable tasks while working alongside the robots, they said. Keep the slang. Flexibility, adaptability, and precision are everything in today's supply chain, explained Nishan, global leader for AMRs at Corber Supply Chain. Our partnership with Bio is a testament to Corber's dedication to offer the right tools to make this a reality. 
Robotics bring a new level of performance to warehousing and logistics. He said, our expertise combined with Balio's unique solutions will empower business around the world to conquer today's complexity, complexities, I mean, and to evolve with consumer and industry demands to capitalize on all the future holds. Man, people slang. <laughs> Well, hello and welcome. Master it's great to have you with us uh, for today's masterclass session titled How Robots Can Increase Safety in Your Warehouse. We're pleased to have Mr. John Santagate on hand. Uh, I'm your host. My name is Tom Goldstein. I come to you from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, Tennessee. I serve as the Haslam Chair of Logistics and Professor of Supply Chain Management, as well as serving as the Co-Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Business Logistics. Today, we're joined by John Santagate. John is a veteran of the Kerber Supply Chain Masterclass Series. We've had John participate in two previous sessions, and they've been fantastic, and hence we've got him back for more insights in the area of robotics and applying it to safety. Um, he's Vice President of Robotics for Kerber Supply Chain, and he has leadership experience across a variety of technology areas, including roles in sales, consulting, and research including uh, leading um, industry analysis. Uh, he's a proud graduate and now instructor at his alma mater, the University of Massachusetts, Massachusetts at Lowell. And um, I also recently learned that John is a certified Tennessee squire. If you're curious about what that means, uh, let's just say that he knows his way around Lynchburg, Tennessee. So I'm going to turn things over to John in just a few minutes, but please allow me to cover just a few items with you before we get into the subject. First, you might be wondering, why are we here? What's the purpose of the Masterclass? Some of you may be joining us for the first time. Again, we sincerely welcome you. Uh, the purpose of this series is to tackle the challenges of today's increasingly complex supply chain, bringing you best practices and innovative thinking from academics like myself, as well as industry insiders and senior leaders like John. We're focused on the subject of workforce efficiencies and safety in this particular masterclass. Uh, but you'll see that uh, we have uh, other masterclasses that we've completed, and those sessions are available to you on demand. However, we're going to have one more session in this masterclass following today's, and that's going to be next Tuesday at the same time, high noon, U.S. Eastern time. Uh, and we're going to be talking about adding automation to improve safety and increase productivity. So we're going to be rounding out this particular masterclass series. And I'll also make you aware that we've got a couple of more, a couple more masterclasses in store for you in the areas of SAP implementation, as well as disruption mitigation in the next few weeks. So be looking for announcements in that regard. But, um, we welcome, uh, again, your uh, your input in these these sessions, and so let's go to some housekeeping items to give you a sense for how you can participate. First of all, your your microphones are muted out there, so uh, who knows, uh, you may have a cacophony of things going on at your uh, your home or workplace there, but we're muted, so uh, you can't, uh, we don't hear any of that uh, cacophony going on out there, uh, but we do welcome your questions, and so there is an opportunity for you to uh, submit your questions uh, at any time during the webinar. Uh, just go to the uh, go to webinar menu and find the questions tab, and you can submit questions, like I said, at any point. Um, speaking of questions, though, let's take a look at the results from today's poll. Again, the question was, what steps have you taken to improve safety in your warehouse? And we had two-thirds of you. Uh, respond to the survey, which is a, a pretty nice response rate. And uh, John, any reaction to what you see here? It looks like uh, half of our respondents said that they had re-engineered processes. Um, half indicated increased training. Half also indicated adding visual reminders with 30% saying that they had um, automated or added technology. And then 20% came up with something else. John, any quick reactions to what you see here from our poll? Yeah, no, Tom, it, it, that makes a lot of sense, especially, I think, when um, when you consider the idea of adding automation to technology that comes along with increasing training and increasing, you know, uh, or re-engineering processes. So, you know, those are some of the low-hanging fruit areas to, to drive safety improvements. So, 
nothing that really jumps out. I think it makes a lot of sense. Okay, fantastic. We're going to build on that. And uh, again, 30% had uh, indicated automation or technology, and uh, we're going to help to illuminate that potential uh, in today's session. So uh, let's go ahead and jump into uh, a few uh, opening remarks that I have to offer. And I thought of going to OSHA statistics, which uh, most of you probably are familiar with, with OSHA, the um, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, which is an agency within the Department of Labor here in the United States. And, you know, they're pretty keen to keep track of injuries and, and unfortunately deaths that occur uh, in the workplace, all workplaces, but particularly industrial workplaces like warehouses. And uh, they note that the unsafe use of forklifts is a primary source of life-threatening injury. And most operations today, stateside and beyond, uh, continue to depend on the forklift as a primary means of conveyance for both large and small loads in the warehouse. And you can read some of the other listed hazards there, but the frequency of in uh, injury and fatal incidents as documented on the right is too frequent and too severe, uh, particularly in light of our challenges to retain labor uh, in our sector these days. So if we move on to the next uh, slide there, um, you know, here are some alarming statistics uh, from OSHA. Um, about 100 employees are killed and 95,000 injured every year while operating forklifts in all industries. Uh, now, that's this, these are U.S. data only, so the worldwide numbers would be even greater and John's going to shed some further light on uh, OSHA data, and particularly in, in the warehouse environment. But uh, again, we're, uh, I, I think the questions, as we look at the recommendations that OSHA brings forward here, you know, these are kind of timeless recommendations about the safe operation of forklifts. I think we need to ask ourselves whether we need to be so dependent on the forklift and conventional forms of mechanization in the warehouse. Are there better ways to convey product? And what are the benefits that we'd see from a productivity as well as, uh, importantly, a safety standpoint? So to help address these questions, uh, again, we have uh, among the most foremost experts uh, on the planet uh, on the topic uh, in John Santigate. So, John, how can robotics help to alleviate the risk posed by conventional conveyance techniques? Uh, thank, thank you, Thomas. Thank you for the introduction. And, uh, yeah, over the course of the next 15 or so minutes, we'll, we'll dive into uh, exactly how the robot, robotics is hopefully did some of the, you know, safety and risk-related elements within the warehouse. Uh, but, you know, indirectly, you know, with your introduction, you, you bring up an interesting point, and, and that point is that there are different degrees of injury that happen in the warehouse. Uh, uh, and in this specific case, as you mentioned, related to forklift accidents. Um, now keep in mind, uh, as Tom indicated, I'll just say him as I go through the data in this presentation. Uh, it's based on U.S. data, uh, but the importance of safety in the warehouse is really a global concern. Uh, Tom, in what you presented, you indicated that 95,000 injuries uh, occur per year relative to the forklifts. Uh, and in some other data that, that we'll look at in a moment here, we find that over 20% of those injuries are serious injuries. Uh, and you also mentioned about 100 people are killed um, in the United States each year due to forklift accidents. So, again, different degrees of injuries uh, um, you know, can occur in the warehouse. So I think we're all familiar with that. Uh, but the thing is, you know, we can't blame the forklifts for the accidents. Uh, when accidents occur, they are human error. Uh, human is not paying attention. Human is doing something they shouldn't be doing. Uh, human is trying to do more than the machine is capable of. Uh, you know, and, and more often than not, injuries in the warehouse are the result of human error, uh, and at times the result of an inappropriate process. And those inappropriate processes can introduce unnecessary risk, which is also uh, you know, a form of human error. So, really, the common denominator in most workplace accidents is the human. It's human error. Uh, you know, that said, but not all injuries in the warehouse are going to be vehicle accident related. Uh, it's easy to look at forklift accidents, uh, uh, but injuries occur at many locations in the warehouse. Uh, they can be occurred by many different circumstances. 
And uh, in a moment, we'll take a look deeper at some of the causes and, and uh, you know, types of work that are occurring when our injury happens. Uh, if we can jump to the next slide, uh, you know, th there is a lot of data out there relative to injuries and safety in the warehouse. Uh, as Tom indicated, there's organizations like the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics and OSHA that really track data related to workplace safety. These organizations really do a good job of dissecting the data uh, of such instances that allow for an analysis of how accidents occur, where they occur, uh, why injuries happen in the workplace. Uh, and with this data, you know, it, it's on the operation to start to leverage this information to find opportunities to drive improvement uh, to safety-related elements within their operation. Uh, you know, likely and likely unsurprising to, to many of you in the audience, uh, research, recent data has found that, uh, you know, the transportation and warehousing industries has the second highest rate of non-fatal workplace injury per 100 full-time workers uh, at a rate of 4.5% of workers having experienced a non-fatal incident. You know, this uh, is the point to really consider here. You know, the total number of injuries in the industry in 2018 was over 221,000 221, injuries. Uh, but the key point uh, is the number of instances per 100 workers, right? So the, what's the, the frequency of injury relative to the number of workers that are in a particular industry, uh, which in this case for warehouse workers is quite significant, uh, especially in an industry where historically over the last several years we've seen an ongoing labor shortage. So while companies struggle to bring labor into the warehouse, you know, they also must be battling to keep their people safe and healthy. By keeping people safe and healthy in the workplace, you know, we're working to mitigate the risk of turnover and to reduce the need and impact to continuously bring new, often temporary labor into the warehouse, which introduces people that are unfamiliar with the operation itself and unfamiliar with the processes, which again, escalates or increases um, the risk related to the, the work that's occurring within those four walls. If we can jump to the to the next slide here. So while the previous slide really looked at non-fatal injuries, this slide is looking at instances of work-related injuries that did result in loss of life. Uh, what I find particularly surprising uh, what I don't find surprising, I should say, is that the construction industry really has the highest number of fatalities overall. Uh, what I do find surprising is that the transportation and warehousing industry comes in second related to fatal injuries in the workplace. And, you know, this is something that we in the warehousing industry really have to work, uh, work on to improve. What's more concerning here is that the transportation and warehousing industry is also ranked second in terms of fatal injuries per 100,000 full-time employees. So for every 100,000 FTEs in the transportation and warehousing industries, 14 of those workers will unfortunately be involved in a fatal injury in the workplace each year. Uh, so the, the question we have to ask ourselves is why? Why is this happening? Why is it, you know, 14 uh, people at risk each year. Why is this industry the second uh, highest in terms of fatalities per that 100,000 worker threshold? Uh, you know, so one way to look at that is the complexity of the industry itself. Uh, warehousing and transportation is an extremely large industry with a wide range of circumstances, little standard and little standardization between different operating environments. Um, so, so I think more importantly, uh, it's an industry that often relies upon significant amounts of manual effort. And again, the more manual effort we introduce, the more risk of, of human error. Uh, again, human error is often the cause of an accident. And so the challenge for the industry is to look at how to reduce the risk of human error in the process in the first place. Uh, and obviously, uh, I believe strongly that automation and robotics presents an opportunity to do just this. Uh, if we can jump to, slide, to the next slide here, um, now, while well, the previous data set really looked broadly at injury, this specific data set looks, uh, looks at the causes of non-fatal injuries uh, on the left-hand side of your screen, uh, and on the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see the worker type or the type of work being performed. Uh, the biggest cause of industry injury here in the workplace is and has historically been overexertion and strain-related injury. Uh, this often comes from repetitive movements or trying to lift heavy objects. 
Uh, the second most frequent cause of injuries are falls or slips and trips. So these would be movement-related uh, injuries. Think about, you know, this may be a forklift-related element as well, but, you know, workers that have to continuously get into and out of a fork truck to place a case on a pallet in a, in a case pick the pallet operation, for example. Uh, that's introducing steps in the process that inject uh, unnecessary risk. Uh, and the third highest cause of these injuries is contact with objects and equipment, uh, which again could be a collision with a Ford truck or some other piece of equipment in the operating environment. Uh, you know, regarding the roles that experience workplace related injuries, you know, topping the list here are work warehouse related jobs, laborers and freight, uh, stock work and material workers. These workers experience injury at a rate over 2.6% of workers per year experience a non-fatal injury. Uh, you know, this isn't the highest rate for 10,000 workers, but the rate of instances of injury resulting in time away from work for this group far exceeds the next highest in terms of number of instances of injury in the workplace. So overall, uh, the point here is that workplace related injuries are frequent and, you know, chances are your organizations experience some degree of impact from a worker getting hurt on the job. So if we jump to the next slide here, um, you know, we want to look at, in addition to the impact on morale and the impact on the health and well-being of the workers in the warehouse, which, by the way, should always be the primary concern when looking to improve workplace safety, uh, there's also a significant economic impact related to workplace injuries. Um, it, it, again, going back to the data from the U.S. Department of Labor, uh, 95 million people will miss work each year due to an on-the-job injury, and warehousing is the leading uh, industry contributing to these injuries overall. Uh, the financial impact of workers missing time due to injury can be broken down into two categories. Uh, the first is your direct expenses, which are those tangible costs uh, such as medical expenses or workers' compensation and insurance, for example, dollars that are being spent are specifically related to injury. The second element um, is indirect costs associated with workers missing work, and that tends to be much higher than the direct expenses. These are things such as the cost of hiring and training or replacement, for example, uh, lost productivity, and other elements that are not you know, direct dollars spent but will have a significant impact on the cost of uh, a worker that has been hurt on the job. You know, it, It's kind of like an iceberg. You, know, you only see the top one-third of the expense tier, with the bigger impacts uh, remaining hidden. And so, you know, the bottom line is that workplace safety is a, is a significant improvement area uh, that if left untreated can have significant individual uh, impacts, but also really can have significant economic impact on, on an overall operation. So if we can jump to uh, the next slide here, you know, as I see it, uh, th there are many ways to address workplace safety, uh, but certainly, you know, modern robotic technology can and should play a role in addressing safety in the in the warehouse and in the workplace today. Um, you know, if we think back to the first slide that I shared with uh, that gift that had the fork truck taking down all the racking and then and then the big collapse immediately afterwards. You know, this occurred because a worker made an operational error that resulted in a collision with the racking. An autonomous mobile robot that could have been used in that instance would not have attempted to bypass the particular obstruction. Mobile robots today are equipped with significant safety measures that prevent them from moving too fast and prevent them from colliding with stationary objects. Uh, you know, accidents may still occur uh, with these environments if you have got workers operating fork trucks, for example, and perhaps colliding with that sort of a technology. Um, but the robots themselves are not going to be the, the cause of those sorts of collisions that, again, goes back to human error. Um, you know, mobile robots wouldn't even be uh, approved for operation in warehousing or environments if they could not and have not been proven to be able to safely operate. Uh, these systems are designed with safety features such as 3D vision systems, LiDAR, and other sensors. Uh, in combination with sophisticated mapping software and operational software that is designed to ensure the robots safely navigate in their environments. Uh, there is a degree of artificial intelligence embedded in these pieces of equipment that allow them to 
sense and respond in real time to their operating environment. If there's an obstruction or, or if they see something coming out of an aisle that's not a part of the map, the robots know to avoid uh, that circumstance. So uh, the intelligence that's built into these technolo this technology is really driving uh, the safety features that are required to be able to operate in these environments. Uh, you know, for bulk material movements, you know, warehouses can look um, to reduce manual pork truck driven miles, for example, uh, and even help improve ergonomics by reducing the frequency by which a worker would have to enter and exit these vehicles. Uh, and again, by doing so, reduce the risk of an injury due to tripping and falling during uh, an exit or an entry to that vehicle. Uh, additionally, and not shown on this particular slide, is the potential value of exoskeleton robotic technology. Exoskeletons uh, have recently been released onto the market for commercial operations that are designed to reduce overexertion and strain related injuries uh, by leveraging robotic technology to augment human strength and movements. So it's not only about the movement of the material itself, uh, but today we're seeing robotic technology that's designed to strengthen the human body and allow people to move more efficiently. Uh, imagine being able to lift, you know, 80 pounds over and over again, just as if you were lifting a pen today. That's the power of this uh, of exoskeleton technology that is that has been released and continues to be improved uh, to drive safety in the workplace. We can jump to the next slide here. Um, you know, so that, that's another we talk about bulk material movement. What about the picking processes? Again, when we think about the causes of injury breeds and the types of workers that are experiencing injury in the warehouse, you know, robots are taking on movement-related tasks, and by doing so, they reduce the steps and miles that workers have to take, which in turn reduces the risk of a slip and fall. Uh, it reduces the instances of fatigue and fatigue-related injury uh, to the workers, uh, and both relative to in-aisle collaborative robotics and goods to person robotics, both of which you can see on your screen here, you know, each of those models can deliver operational efficiencies, but at the same time, uh, help to improve working conditions for the workers in the warehouse. You know, while collaborative uh, in-aisle robots reduce walking by keeping pickers in aisles and take away the long walk and, and allow workers to work more efficiently within uh, smaller zones, um, you know, they take on the, the movement of goods and in this person environments. And you know, we keep pickers at stationary picking modules uh, that shuttle work to the picker. So again, you're reducing the, the potential risk of that worker tripping and falling uh, throughout the course of their work, uh, work day. Um, you know, in these models, safety is really increased by reducing the distance and the frequency of movements, which thus reduces the risk of injury to the worker. Uh, but also, in addition to thinking about the movement-related elements, this technology allows for heads-up, hands-free work, right? It allows the worker to be more aware of their surroundings through the course of their work because they're not looking at a handheld device uh, and so forth. They're paying more able to pay attention to what's occurring uh, around them in the work environment. Um, if we could jump to the next slide here, you know, a, a bit of a contrarian view to, to what was just stated. Um, you know, too much of a good thing can actually turn into a bad thing. We've all heard that before. Uh, a study actually recently found that the rates of in injury within Amazon fulfillment centers that were leveraging their own goods to person picking systems was more than double the industry average. Um, you know, I don't believe this is a factor of the use of robotics, though. Uh, I believe that um, this is a factor of operational expectations, putting pressure uh, to work faster, and those workers feeling under pressure to achieve uh, operational KPIs that exceeded their human abilities to meet those uh, those expectations, right? So what this case emphasizes, and going back to the poll, I think is quite significant, um, the case emphasizes the need to combine process and technology expectations so that we don't expect more than human operators can deliver even when equipped with robotic technology. It's not just about creating more efficient people. It's about doing so in a way that the people that are working in the space aren't forced to have to try to over-exceed what they are physically capable of. We can do more with robots, but there's always a point of diminishing returns. Uh, and I think that goes, stands true with most technology uh, deployments. And then if we can jump to the last piece here, um, you know, the put, there's another element here that I think is important. Uh, with the push for distancing in the warehouse, in order to adapt to the risks associated with illness, and in this case specifically COVID-19, 
warehouses are really looking for ways to complete the same amount of work. And in some instances, uh, especially related to e-commerce fulfillment, um, meet increased levels of demand with less humans in the loop. So we're seeing operations look to extend from single shift operations, for example, to multi-shift operations. But we're also seeing organizations embrace mobile robots to allow for a few pickers, for example, to complete the same amount uh, of work as a larger human workforce, thus injecting distancing into the processes. Um, you know, in addition, you know, it's not just about the, the, the work itself. You know, there's also um, mobile robots today that are equipped with sanitation equipment, UV lighting arrays or aerosols that can be used to autonomously cleanse working spaces from potential pathogens. So as you switch, move from a single shift, for example, to a multi-shift, in between those shifts, the opportunity does exist to deploy mobile robots that will go through and sanitize the, the workspace prior to the second shift coming on. Hmm. So overall, you know, not only are robots a tool to drive productivity and efficiency into the warehouse, they're also being used in other innovative ways that, that help us deliver safer warehousing environments uh, by reducing certain tasks and allowing workers to remain aware and allowing workers uh, to have to make less movements overall in the warehouse. Uh, so if we can jump to the next slide, um, you know, in conclusion here from my piece, you know, I'd say don't be like Daryl. You know, look for ways to leverage modern technology. Uh, couple that with process improvement to reduce the risk in the warehouse. Keep your workers ha uh, healthy and happy. Uh, and with that, I'd say, uh, Tom, back to you. Fantastic. Well, thank you, John. And thanks for illuminating the, the many different ways in which robotics uh, can aid in the warehouse.